honored and thrilled when Dr. Steven Steinebel agreed to kick off our summit. He's the director of digital medicine at Scripps Translational Institute and has been leading the charge alongside digital health pioneer Dr. Eric Topol after receiving a $120 million grant from the NIH focused on extending precision precision medicine successes uh, to disease such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and other mental health diseases. This is an epic adventure. Um, excuse me. It is an adventure, but it's an, an epic endeavor. <laughs> and I can't wait to learn more about it. So let's uh, welcome him to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, everybody. It's great to have the agenda read before you, and you realize that you're by far the most uninteresting um, topic that you'll get to address for the next two days. But I will try to um, make it. There we are. Everybody can see it. Good. All right. So I'm going to talk about eradicating the one-size-fits-all practice of medicine, um, which sounds really nice. And, and I would say, you know, doctors have been trying to do this for decades. But I want to talk about, you know, what tools we have now, and especially eventually uh, conclude with the All of Us uh, pr research program, which will go into the, the clinical side of the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, these are my disclosures, and none of which I'm really going to be focusing on any of these um, topics. All right. So everybody has a different idea in their mind of what precision medicine is, and I'd like to take credit for using eyeglass prescriptions as my idea, but actually it was from Barack Obama when he was talking about precision medicine. But the idea is, when we, you know, for all the people in the room who are wearing contact lenses or glasses, um, you know, you don't go to the um, optician and pick out, you know, just your favorite frames based on whether you have trouble seeing near or far. Um, that was a very blunt way uh, to determine what kind of uh, therapeutic intervention you needed to improve your vision. Instead, we go through some kind of an elaborate, um, this is changing, we could do it digitally somewhere in the future, but at least today, for the most part, elaborate exam that, that um, will end up getting you a prescription that's very much based on what's unique about your vision in both your eyes, um, the size of your eyeball, um, the, um, the curvature of your cornea, um, the position and, um, and um, uh, characteristics of your lens, and we put all that together, and then for each eye, you get a complicated prescription that uh, no one ever taught me how to read in medical school, but somehow this seems to work, and it, it's very precise, and it works for all of us um, uh, very effectively, so that we, we all have very, very different glasses that work precisely the way we need them to work for either far vision, near vision, or, or both. If we turn our attention to something that is um, that is we've been less successful at with precision treatment, and I'm going to focus on high blood pressure for several reasons. One is you'll notice on the graph um, that it is the number one risk factor for early um, mortality and morbidity globally. There are over one billion people with high blood pressure worldwide. Um, there are of all the people who have high blood pressure, only 13% have that well controlled. And when you think of that, this is, we've had the ability to measure high blood pressure since the 1880s. And, um, and this far along with, with treatments that cost less than pennies a day, um, we still don't have it, have uh, um, even a, a, a large minority of individuals adequately treated. Treating high blood pressure is algorithmic. It is um, designed that anybody, certainly you don't need four years of medical school, three years of residency, maybe three years of fellowship or so after that to treat high blood pressure. It's, it's, it, this algorithm is not based on what makes us terribly unique. There's some qualifiers of age, whether you have diabetes or whether you have chronic kidney disease, and then further down, whether you're, if you're African American or not. But other than that, there's nothing unique about our blood pressure, about us, that guides our antihypertensive treatments. Very similar is diabetes. So these are the two um, most common chronic conditions for seeing a physician in the United States today. On that previous graph, diabetes was number three in terms of a risk factor contributing to mor morbidity and mortality. A little bit less than 9% of the global population um, has diabetes. It's the sixth, it, uh, by itself, is the sixth leading cause of death, the third leading risk factor towards death. 
And if you look at, at um, uh, pre-diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, that over 50% of the U.S. population over 65 has pre-diabetes. On the graphs, you can see it's been a gradual um, steady increase since the 1980s. And then below, you can see it's projected to increase by 55% um, into the 2030s. So this is a huge um, problem that we're facing not only in the United States but globally. And again, this is the algorithm that, that's, that it guides that the societies of experts, just like of hypertension, say this should guide our treatment for diabetes. And on here, there's really nothing that's unique. And even if you look at like pre-diabetes, the very first lines on there about um, healthy living or healthy diet, activity, weight loss, and things like that, a very global statement to everybody, right? So it's the same thing. There's nothing unique about um, you or your needs that that addresses. So compared to like eyeglasses, when you look at two of the um, um, major risk factors for early death and uh, morbidity worldwide, it's very imprecise medicine. It is very much a one-size-fits-all, very algorithmic medicine. So then when we talk about precision medicine, what are we um, talking about? And we can use the NIH's definition um, that, uh, that is used to support the All of Us Precision Medicine Research Program, an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, life, and lifestyle for each person. A very accurate diagnosis, a much simpler one to be and, and equally accurate is understanding the patient as a unique human being. And I would change this um, to say the person, not just a patient, before they're a patient, um, understanding the uniqueness uh, of an individual and what makes us unique. And this is not a new concept. In fact, Hippocrates, well over 2,000 years ago, um, that was quoted, um, is quoted as, it's far more important to know the, the, what person the disease has than what disease the person has. So really, instead of just saying so-and-so with hypertension and diabetes, is really understanding the uniqueness of that person, and that's going to help guide us um, treat that individual. So when you think about what makes us unique, um, um, one of the first things we think of, and, and too often we think is our genetics. And, and often it stops there. I've read articles that essentially says genomic medicine equals precision medicine, and that's wrong, but it partially right. Certainly our genomics tell us a lot about ourselves, but there's a lot of other things. There are built environment that we live in and how we take advantage of that. So people who live in rural areas or people who live in cities next to parks versus areas that don't have any parks and any safe places to exercise. Our food choices and what our food choices are. Um, do we live in a, in a fresh, food, uh, de fresh um, food desert where we can't get fruits and vegetables and all, all of our um, food we can get at a gas station um, or um, a restaurant, um, or do we have healthy choices? Um, wearable sensors are a huge part of what we focus on, <clears throat> and that, that is part of understanding our variation in physiological response. Right now, when we do really well, we get an occasional snapshot of our, our physiological response, and I'll talk more about blood pressure um, later in, in precision medicine, but you think of that, most people will get their blood pressure measured once in a doctor's office. Um, maybe you get uh, blood tests there where you get your blood sugar and your electrolytes measured. Um, but really understanding how we differ physiologically in, in different situations is going to be key to understanding what's unique. Um, our family and our upbringing, where we work, um, our health care that we receive and, the, and um, the information with the same diagnoses, we often get treated very differently. That's a problem, the variability, but it's also kind of a lessons and things we can learn and be able to collect all that information. Um, as well as just the environments we live in, um, whether you live in a, a, a tropical environment versus a cold weather environment, and um, what allows you to do. All of this, and even more that isn't shown in this slide, all enters into what makes us unique and it affects our health and our wellness and, um, and our knowledge of understanding how to best keep that individual um, healthy. So what are the tools we have now in the technology that can allow us to do this differently? As I mentioned, doctors for ages have been trying, for centuries, have been trying to, um, to treat an individual uniquely. 
Um, but what makes today different and gives us an unprecedented opportunity to really move the field of healthcare and wellness um, so much further is first our, our, our understanding and our ability um, to sequence our, our um, genetic information. Um, this is a, um, a forecast for the um, number of genetic DNA sequencing that's going to occur over the next several years. You can see it's taken off exponentially. First, the uh, first human uh, genome was described in the early 2000s. And this is a huge data um, um, challenge. Um, for us that in this paper really nicely compared it to other um, data dense fields such as astronomy, uh, Twitter, um, YouTube, and, and looking at like comparing astronomy with one exabyte a year and genomics looking at two to 40 exabytes a year of data. And, and we have to figure out um, how to not only take, uh, to um, collect that, but to take advantage of all that information, because there's a lot of unknowns in there, which I'll touch on a little bit. The other major breakthrough is, is the wearable digital technologies um, that we have access to that helps us really understand um, how we're all different. Um, helps us um, understand we all deal with diets differently, we all deal with stress differently, we all um, deal with climate change differently, we all need different amounts of sleep. Um, all of those things in the past we've been able to collect only in surveys and very imprecisely. Now we can collect them much more precisely. We can understand how our glucose has changed with meals, how our blood pressure changes with stress, how our sleep changes with activity, how activity affects our cardiovascular fitness. Well, it's, it's, it's a whole new field almost of understanding of physiology um, that, that we're going to um, have as much, when, as we start doing this, we're going to have as many unknowns um, uh, uh, um, come to the forefront than there are new, no, um, new knowns that we learn, and that's going to be exciting because then we can build on those. So let me give some examples. When we think of, of an example of the success or the potential for success in precision medicine, I, I think of cancer treatment comes to mind. And there's something easier about that. It's certainly not easy, but it's easier because uh, cancer is a, a pure uh, genetic abnormality. And, um, but when I was a medical student, cancers were based on where the tumor f was found, either in the lung or in the pancreas or in the colon or in the breast or in the prostate. That's how you defined a cancer. And then how you treated it was based on studies that have been studied in prostate and pancreatic and colon cancer. And they essentially were um, poisons that um, were designed to kill rapidly dividing cells and nothing very unique about it. But over time, in this example, a non-small cell um, lung cancer, we've gotten um, wiser and we're able to break down the cancers into more than just saying, okay, we found this in the, in the uh, lung and it's a non-small cell based on the way it looks under histology. And we've learned more and more about the genomic drivers of those cancers. So what is the, what is the genetic mutation that led to that cancer and then how do we target that genetic mutation? And we're still relatively early in that, but we're making tremendous progress and it's very exciting and in fact, just this past week, um, this was an article in Science and in a major shift in cancer drugs to go tissue agnostic, which makes complete sense. There have been so many successes when a, a uh, colon cancer drug was used to treat somebody's lung cancer because it, it what didn't matter where the, the tissue of origin, what mattered is what the genomic driver was. And there are, are a, a list of drugs in early stage development and, and some that are clinically available that um, the FDA just recently approved, one that is um, tissue agnostic. It doesn't matter where the cancer came from, um, but it depends on what the uh, genetic driver of that cancer is. Now, when, when we look, so cancer, pure genomics, but then we have other, and I'm going to turn back to hypertension and diabetes and look at that. So in the top left hand of the picture is your typical way of measuring um, blood pressure. So all of our work, all of our genomic work and other is based on, on large registries or large collections of data that typically have an office blood pressure as the measurement of it. Now we know from prior studies that there's a lot of familial inheritance in, in um, essential hypertension, but, um, and they found over 100 genetic loci with hypertension, but our ability to predict somebody's blood pressure based on their genomics or their likelihood for getting a, a, 
uh, developing hypertension with age is incredibly weak. So we can predict if you have all of the genomic loci, and this is a genomic risk scores um, that, that looked and identified that maybe um, you had a trend towards a, a systolic blood pressure increase of four or five millimeters mercury, but that your risk for developing hypertension was um, really minimal until maybe you had the highest risk score and there was a, um, a significant increase there, but a small um, relative increase in your risk for developing hypertension. So the genes certainly don't, um, what the, the genetic information we understand so far doesn't explain it. And part of the problem is, is I don't think we understand the physiology of high blood pressure at all, because we're, we're limited to measuring it in a doctor's office. Um, this, these are some data um, for two individuals um, who we've, as part of um, data that the Withings individuals have shared with us, 56,000 individuals who measure their blood pressure almost on a daily basis with their Withings blood pressure cuff. And looking at somebody who has, on the left-hand side, with wide variability and somebody on the right-hand side with much less variability. So the person on the left has blood pressures that are up in 170, systolic blood pressures of 170, and others that are down at 110, whereas the other individual varies um, between um, 120 and 140. That's still, even with the light, the small amount of variability, compared to the three or four or five millimeters mercury genetic prediction scores that we have, it's pretty minuscule. And now in office studies, I don't want to diminish the importance if you got a true average decrease in blood pressure of three or four millimeters mercury. That is very important, but that's only when we measure it in this very artificial setting, and we don't know if when that person went to the office where they were in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in their trajectory of, of blood pressures going. Um, high and low on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we look at, at, that's just looking at it on a daily basis. If you look at it over years, these investigators have identified four different trajectories of what blood pressure does over time, all of these that are, are significantly associated with your risk of bad outcomes over time. So we almost never have enough data to measure the trajectory of blood pressure. For the physicians in the room, you usually think of somebody who has orthostatic hypotension, so changes in your blood pressure from sitting to standing as being only when you're dehydrated and that normally otherwise you don't. Well, this was a study from the print, uh, SPRINT trial that measured um, sitting and standing blood pressure and found this dramatic uh, uh, change in that a actually 5% of the population had a 20 mil either a 20 millimeter decrease in blood pressure when they stood up or a 20 millimeter increase when they stood up. We have no idea what that means because it's never really been measured before. And then similarly, we've known for a while, and the few people who are willing to tolerate wearing a 24-hour ambulatory monitor, um, that when you, if your blood pressure doesn't decrease at night, um, that, that your long-term outcomes are worse. And um, we don't, but no one likes wearing a blood pressure cuff at night because it wakes them up every hour. So now we have technologies. This is just a wrist cuff um, that, can, that can, is much easier to use. This is the second generation. These are both by Omron. Um, but there are other unique technologies that are not cuff-based, and either ones that don't even measure blood pressure per se, but pulse wave velocity. And then multiple companies working on continuous blood pressure that's going to change our information. Similarly, with type 2 diabetes, and I won't go in, into the details of this, but we, have, we know 120 different um, variants. Um, it also has a high heritability. Um, we know that, that um, our risk for diabetes is very dependent on our ancestry, but we don't ha have the ability to refine it well enough to understand. And we know in the people who are wearing continuous glucose monitors that hemoglobin A1C, our measure of what successful glucose can mean, or glucose management over a three-month period, it can be very, very, very different um, sways in fasting blood glucose over time. Um, and there are multiple um, organizations working on developing continuous blood or glucose monitors, including a contact lens that Google got a lot of publicity for. I'm going to um, have, give you one example of really what we can do with precision medicine. This is a study, and, and this just looks at, at four different people's representative people response to eating the same amount of bread at a meal and, and how their glucose changed after that meal. And you can see very different changes. These investigators um, using um, microbiome and blood tests and uh, um, questionnaires and anthropotic measurements and dietary uh, and using machine learning developed a, a predictive algorithm to guide your diet specific to you and multiple characteristics. 
And what they found, and you can see in red is, a is glucose changes with a bad diet and green with a good diet, that they were able to significantly <coughs> control glucose after meals um, by, by getting, um, providing an individual of precise guidance for them based on all of these criteria of what they, um, uh, what they should eat. And this is what we should be really um, striving for to be able to do with most everything. So I'm going to conclude with just very quickly going with all of us research program. This is um, designed to answer all these questions that we've talked about and to, to really change this one size fits all. It's in beta phase, so we've, uh, of what will be a million individuals, we've enrolled 100 friends and family so far, it just kicked off two weeks ago. Um, uh, this is, um, it's the cornerstone of the Precision Medicine Initiative, so it's called All of Us, it's the clinical part, but this is a million individuals by design, a very diverse population, um, and um, the key aspects of this, I'll say in the value, it's open to everybody, including any scientists, so just because Scripps is related to it or in Vanderbilt and Mayo, it isn't just our data, it's everybody's data. Anybody here, and you don't have to be an academician, um, it's open to everybody to look at the data. So far, it's only a research platform, but we're going to build more and more tools into it. Um, we have, there's about 20 different partners in, on the grant countrywide. Many of them healthcare provider organizations will direct, um, directly enroll individuals, will be enrolling um, 350,000 direct volunteers across the country. So in conclusion, I think we're in the midst of a uh, digital and genomic revolution that is just starting to make inroads into health research and clinical health care. Precision medicine, though, is much more than just improved knowledge. So it's, it's not just bringing scientists the knowledge, it's really improved implementation, sharing that information. And that's one of the key things about the All of Us program is it isn't just researchers on a one-way data suck from participants. It's giving all that information back to the participants in a meaningful way to them. And then finally, the All of Us Precision Medicine Research Program, taking advantage of these uh, genomic and digital technology advances, is, is designed to accelerate uh, their impact on transforming all aspects of medical care. Thank you, everybody, for your attention, and enjoy the rest of the meeting. <laughs>